that we've seen. Uh, I know the last bird that I saw, uh, I saw chimney swifts. Uh, the other day I was working in my backyard and I heard this kind of weird fluttering noise above me and I look up thinking that there were going to be swallows and they were actually swifts. So they had these really shallow wing beats um, and I've not seen a chimney swift since last spring. Uh, so that was the last cool bird I saw. And the last cool bird Sarah saw, uh, her favorite bird today is the spotted towhee. Uh, me and her have been going down to Chatfield State Park to run our virtual bird banding programs. And I know there's been a lot of spotted towhees down there. So a little bit uh, about our organization, the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. We are a nonprofit uh, environmental organization and our mission is to conserve birds and their habitats. And we do this through an integrated approach of science, education, and land stewardship. Uh, so we have our three tiers. We have the science team, uh, they're out there advancing knowledge. We have our stewardship team who we consider our boots on the ground. Uh, they're working with private landowners and ranchers to make their land as bird friendly as possible while also benefiting the ranchers as well. And then we have our education team, uh, which Sarah and myself and the others that have brought to, uh, done these webinars with you. We are all part of the education team um, and we're happy that our work is radiating uh, outside of the Rocky Mountain region. I see some of you attending uh, from California and even the East Coast. So we're happy with these virtual programs that we can radiate our work even farther. Okay, so in this webinar, uh, we will be learning lots at Birding 201. So it's our next step uh, from the Birding 101 webinar that we had uh, over a month ago now. So we're going to learn about the diversity of songbirds or passerines as we call them. We're gonna learn how to find tricky birds, how we are gonna take that next step uh, from being just backyard birders uh, to being more intermediate or advanced birding. We're also gonna dive a little bit more into identifying males and females. Uh, like we learned in Meredith's webinar, they can be really tricky. Um, so we'll be having some discussions about that. And then at the very end, uh, we're gonna learn how to become a community or citizen scientists. So we're gonna be talking about uh, one of our favorite uh, apps as birders, we'll be talking about eBird. So the reason why I wanted to do uh, this Birding 201 webinar uh, is when I was a beginner birder, uh, everything was new uh, and it was pretty hard. And one, I remember this one moment is, uh, specifically uh, when I identified a challenging species. Uh, so five or six, sometime uh, some years ago in the past, I was out birding and camping out in the Eastern Sierras, uh, which is a beautiful place if you've not been there. Uh, and I was hiking with a friend and we were birding in this aspen grove. Uh, and I heard some birds, a lot of birds around, but there was one bird that, that drew my attention. I could see it really small, uh, just kind of jumping around the aspens. Uh, and it's being really uh, conspicuous. And I eventually got my binoculars on them and at first I couldn't see anything. It looked like a little brown bird to me, uh, but it luckily stayed a little bit longer and I had the chance to look at it, really um, pay attention to its field marks. And I mostly noticed that it was yellow and there was just this little eyebrow uh, that went over its eye. Uh, and it was actually a warbling vireo. Um, and I remember after identifying that, uh, I felt like I was making that next step. I was able to uh, see more than I used to be able to see. So becoming an intermediate birder, uh, I feel like is the most exciting part. All right, so we're gonna talk about why, why birds? Why do we have these birding webinars? And why uh, do we have a whole organization uh, dedicated to conserving birds? Well, for one, birds are very inspirational. Um, they're amazing creatures, we love to watch them. Birds are also very accessible. Uh, so whether you're tuning in from your, your cabin in the forest or you're tuning in with us today from New York City, um, we can see birds everywhere. It doesn't matter where you are. Uh, birds are also accessible. Um, again, they're everywhere. Uh, they're, we consider them ecosystem services. Uh, I know I don't like to get bit by mosquitoes too often uh, and birds actually provide uh, pest control and, and they also 
do uh, seed dispersal. Um, so they're spreading seeds around, uh, hopefully most of the time native seeds. Birds are also considered environmental indicators. Uh, so birds are often the first group uh, that can be affected by environmental changes, the whole canary in the coal mine. Uh, so birds are amazing. Uh, I'm sure that's why you all signed up for this webinar was to learn and communicate a little bit more about birds. All right, so I love this slide. Uh, we've had this in a couple of our webinars. Um, so how many birds are there? In the world, we have around 10,000 species. Uh, in North America alone, there's around 1,000 species. And then getting down to a state, Colorado, where we are based out of, we have 507 species. Uh, and then Bar Lake, which is our headquarters, uh, that's a birding hotspot. There can be 350 species there that have been identified. So what I wanted to get off with this slide is there are so many birds to learn. Um, it's a lifelong hobby, I think. You're never going to stop learning. Um, and all you need to do if you're feeling a little too comfortable in your home state, uh, if you move a state over or to the other side of the country, uh, you kind of have to start from square one um, and go over all those steps again because you'll probably see some new birds that you've never seen before. All right, so we're going to talk today uh, more about the passerine group, uh, the order of passerines. So Meredith talked a little bit. Uh, she got us into, into the passerine family. And we're going to talk a little bit more about some other birds that are composed in this order. Uh, so this is a huge order of birds. Uh, it includes more than half of all bird species, which is over 6,000 species in the world are considered passerines. In Colorado specifically, there are approximately 175 birds that are classified uh, as passerines that can be seen sometime during any year. And then we get some rarities that come through during migration, and we're talking about a lot of birds to sort out. So today we're going to dive a little bit deeper into passerine ID uh, and hopefully give you some tips and tricks that I've found throughout the years that have been helpful. Um, the passerine family order uh, is really fascinating because you can have such a wide range of birds. You can have that small little kinglet um, all the way up to big common ravens. And we consider passerine songbirds uh, because they have that distinctive vocal organ that allows them uh, to make those beautiful songs that we hear, um, hopefully outside of our windows every morning. All right, so the passerine family. Uh, as you can see, there are lots of families in this order. Um, and all members of a species, they nearly always share some similar plumage or some similar color detail. Uh, the males and the females, adult and young, of nearly all these species, they share a characteristic size, uh, structure, and habits. Uh, they kind of contributes to the look of the species. So when we think of sparrows or we think of warblers or crows and magpies, we think of kind of that family. They all look somewhat similar, uh, which helps us narrow it down. So during uh, the two-part Songbird ID webinar that was a couple weeks back that Meredith hosted, uh, she focused a lot on the flycatchers, the vireos, uh, sparrows, and warblers, um, probably because that's what she mostly catches at our banding stations. Uh, so today, I decided that we are going to focus on identifying swallows. We're going to identify blackbirds and orioles. And we're also going to focus on tanagers, grosbeaks, and buntings. Um, so if you want to jot down these families, that'll kind of give you a little clue on our learning celebrations uh, or our quizzes that we have at the end of this webinar. All right, so I want to, to teach you all how to take our birding to the next step. Um, so how do we find birds that aren't exactly in our backyards? Uh, taking that next step of looking and learning birds and then taking it to new areas. Uh, so to see new birds, you need to explore different habitats. Um, you'll see a larger variety of birds. So what I want you to do in the chat window, I want you to tell us what are your favorite habitats to explore? Um, or what are your favorite habitats that you like to bird in? I know one of, one of my favorite uh, habitats, like I see a lot of people saying, uh, I really like the wetland areas. 
Um, I am attracted to water. I love being around water. Uh, so the more hiking I can do in wetland areas and birding, the better. Yeah, I also like all of them too. Uh, I saw Sarah wrote that. So habitats are really interesting. And each, uh, each habitat that we're in, we're gonna find different types of birds. So that's something to keep in mind as we take our, our next step in bird identification. So also spotting the birds. When we're talking about passerines, uh, we're talking about, for one, a huge order of birds, but we're also talking about birds that are pretty secretive uh, or they're kind of harder to spot. They might be more camouflage. Um, a lot of passerines are also migratory. Uh, so we're not gonna have these birds to look at all year long. Uh, we mostly see them in the, the fall migration or the spring migration that we're in right now. And one last thing I wanna talk about when spotting the bird, one tip that I've kind of always remind myself of, uh, it's, it's important to take the time to wait. Uh, whenever I stop in one area that I think will, you know, maybe I've heard a bird or two and I think it's gonna be kind of birdy, I should just sit and wait. Um, sometimes I wait up to 15 to 30 minutes uh, and let the birds come to me. Um, I know a lot of the times when I'm in a rush and I'm birding and I'm walking a little fast, uh, I can miss a lot of birds that I wouldn't normally see. Um, I know one experience last summer at one of our, our bird camps, uh, me and five other campers, we were out birding and we stopped in a willow thicket and it was right after uh, a thunderstorm went through. So there's like, everything was kind of wet and there was a lot of bird chatter. And I just told everyone, let's just stop and let's just wait here on the side of the trail. Um, and we stood still and had the opportunity to identify like 10 different species uh, of birds. And most of those birds were lifers for our campers. It was the first time uh, they identified them. Um, so I always like to remind people, uh, if you wanna just find new birds, take the time to sit, um, take the time to wait. Uh, they'll most likely come to you. So this brings up a good question about how exactly do we find good birding spots? Uh, so we're gonna be talking a little bit about what eBird hotspots are. All right, so here's a beautiful picture. Um, uh, this is the front range of Colorado, uh, and this is what we call eBird hotspots. Um, so eBird.org is a fa fantastic resource. Um, I find myself nerding out on it uh, a lot. You can really dive into the science um, and explore on that website. So a hotspot uh, is an area where there have been eBird checklists submitted. So the colors that we see on this map, uh, we see a lot of different colors. There's some grays, some blues, some greens, uh, and then some darker red and oranges. So the colors are actually based on the number of species that are observed in those areas. So if you see the gray and the blue, uh, those are lower number of checklists or birds observed there in that area. And then if you look around, we see kind of a couple dark orange or red uh, dots on this map. <clears throat> and those are gonna be our real birdie, the eBird hotspots that we wanna check out. Uh, so the darker red that they are, the more species have been observed, um, even up to like 500 different species. So this is an amazing resource, uh, an amazing database to have as a birder. Uh, it's also fun just to play around with. You can look at it and you can actually, there's hotspots around the world. Uh, when this map pops up, it's just this map of the world with all this different color and hotspots around the world. So it's fun to play around with, but it's also a great tool uh, for you to use um, in your backyard or your yearly trip abroad. Um, I know I plan a lot of my birding trips or leading bird walks based on these um, hotspots. So these are on the eBird website, the eBird.org. I mean, you can kind of see in the upper left hand corner where it says explore, uh, that's the button you click on and then you can dive a little bit deeper. All right, so those little uh, cool bubble dot things that we see, uh, you can click on them. And once you click on them, it's gonna give you uh, a little more detail about that birding hotspot. Uh, so this hotspot is located at our office uh, which is on the north end of Bar Lake. You can click the button that says View Details. And when you click the View T Details, it's gonna show you the most recent checklist submitted. Uh, so the most, most recent birds that have been seen in that area. 
Uh, if you go on to this hotspot, the Burr Conservancy of the Rockies hotspot, you'll most likely see a lot of checklists submitted from our banding coordinator, Colin. Uh, he goes out a lot uh, on his lunch break and usually always does an eBird checklist. Um, so he has a lot of checklists, but we also get a lot of other birders uh, that submit them as well. And then you can see in the lower corner of this screen, you can see that red dot. Um, so that dot is for Bar Lake State Park. Um, and Bar Lake State Park is, again, this uh, reddish color. Uh, so there have been 341 species that have been observed at Bar Lake. And as of two days ago, uh, when I looked at it, there have been 3,835 eBird checklists um, that have been submitted. Uh, if you are in Colorado, you probably know of Bar Lake uh, if you're a birder, but if you don't, uh, I highly suggest uh, getting out there, especially during migration, um, and make sure that you are keeping your social distancing, of course, but it's a great place to bird. We're gonna dive a little bit deeper into what an eBird checklist is uh, at the end of this webinar. Um, but I think it's a cool tool for you to use, and I highly suggest checking it out uh, later on. And if you have been to Bar Lake before, feel free to let us know um, in the chat window. All right, so just like we learned uh, in Birding 101, if you were able to attend that back in the day, <laughs> over a month ago, um, field guides are an essential resource. Uh, so I wanted to just talk a little bit more about why field guides are so important. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit more about instead of Merlin, which is an amazing app, uh, and we all have it hopefully on our, our phones because you never know when you're gonna see a rare bird in a parking lot. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about just a, a field guide, like the actual book. Um, when you're taking the step from a beginner birder to an intermediate birder, the field guide becomes somewhat of your Bible. You read it, you study it, uh, you look at which birds are in which areas. Um, so having that field guide is going to make it probably a lot easier to identify those uncommon birds uh, that you don't see very often. So... I can speak for most of the educators uh, at Burr Conservancy. We all basically use the Sibley Field Guide. Um, it's a great resource for interme intermediate and advanced birders, um, but also for beginning birders. That's actually the, the only field guide I've ever really used um, is the Sibley Field Guide. So as you're going out uh, to these birding hotspots, Merlin is a great tool to use, um, but I like to keep it old fashioned and have the the bird field guide with us as well. So make sure you find one if you have one, great. Um, and if you really wanna learn more, dive into it, read, read a lot, um, read about the descriptions. It will help you learn a lot about bird species. All right, so now we're getting to uh, my favorite part of this webinar. Uh, we're getting to our learning celebrations, uh, or as some people refer to as quizzes. So, First, um, a lot of people attending this webinar, there's a huge range. Some of you might be lifelong expert birders. Uh, some of you might still be in that beginning range, uh, and that's okay. We are here to learn, um, and it's totally okay to not know. Um, we don't know everything, uh, and then we want this to be a learning experience. That's why I like to call them learning celebrations. Uh, so first off, try to narrow it down to family. Um, if you remember, Back in the beginning of this webinar, I mentioned three families that we were going to dive a little bit deeper in, so that could help you narrow it down. And if you know the bird right away, uh, give others a chance to look it up. Um, they might just need a little bit more time in their field guide, and that's okay. Uh, one thing I have found with taking that step from becoming an intermediate birder uh, is we have a tendency to jump to conclusions. Uh, we will see a bird and we'll automatically jump to a conclusion of what it is without really looking at those field marks. Um, when, with this webinar, we're looking at pictures. We won't be looking at live birds today. Um, so it's a great time to really dive into those field marks and really look at it, because fortunately, uh, these birds won't be flying away. One thing I do really want to uh, restate is, again, it's OK not to know. Uh, take your best guess. If you don't know, as long as you're guessing, that means that you're learning. Um, and that's why we have these educational webinars is for us to learn more about birds. So we'll start with our first learning celebration. Uh, it's a fun one. So here we go. And again, 
uh, type your answer into the chat window once you know it, um, but don't jump to conclusions. All right, so this is our first uh, learning celebration we have here. So make sure you're looking a lot at those field marks. These are two species that can be easily uh, mistaken for in the field. So try to look really closely at those field marks. And once you think you know them, uh, feel free to type that into the chat window. And if you know them, uh, let us know what the top and the bottom ones are. Or maybe if you think there's four different species too, let us know why. Well, I see some people talking about the Sibleys. Um, I personally have just the Sibley for the Western uh, side because it is a little bit smaller. I feel like the Sibley to North America, that, that's more of my, my coffee book, my coffee table book. All right, I see some answers coming in. All right, I see that we've narrowed it down, definitely to a swallow. Uh, these are in the swallow family. And swallow identification, uh, it can actually be really, really difficult uh, out in the field, um, especially when they're in flight. Uh, I know when I'm trying to identify swallows, uh, when they're flying around, I get a little dizzy because they fly around so fast. Um, and you're trying to just watch one and pick out a field mark or two. Uh, so when they're in flight, they can be extremely hard. Um, and something about these two species, I see a lot of you have gotten it correct. Uh, the top is the tree swallow and the bottom is the violet green swallow. Uh, and these can actually be in the same habitat. I've seen them both on the same tree at the same time. And some things that I look for when it comes to these two swallows is on the tree swallow, uh, we can see that the white of the throat, uh, it doesn't extend above the eye. Where if you look down at the violet green swallow, uh, the white extends above the eye on that violet green swallow. Uh, so that's usually the first field mark I look for uh, when they're perched. Um, a lot of the time you can't really, unless you're lucky with the lighting, you can't really see the kind of those beautiful iridescent colors. Uh, in these pictures, the tree swallow looks a lot more blue, the violet green a lot more violet green. Um, but again, you're not always gonna see those colors. When swallows are in flight, uh, it's really important to look, especially with these two, at the rump. So the back end, of these swallows, you can tell on the tree swallow, there's only just a little bit line of white. And if you look down at the violet green swallow, you can see there's a lot bigger of a white patch uh, near its rump. Um, swallows, they, again, can be extremely difficult to identify, um, especially in flight. I know last summer I was birding with our campers up in the Rocky Mountains. And I think we had like five different species of swallows all flying over uh, a lake at once. Um, there are tree swallows, violet green swallows, uh, there's northern ruffling swallows and cliff swallows and barn swallows. Um, so looking at those minute details is really important. Um, I think if I were to be a bird of any species, I think I'd want to be a swallow because it always looks like they're having a lot of fun flying around. All right, good job everyone. We're going to move on to our next one and again we're going to try to make it a, a little bit harder. I did say we were going to talk about uh, the differences between males and females so keep that in mind. Um, also if you know right away give yourself a couple seconds to really think about it um, because we do not want to jump to conclusions all the time. Here we go. There are two new bird species. Uh, these are two new families of birds and they can be pretty difficult. So again, especially with the one, these two, uh, try not to jump to a conclusion because uh, a lot of these in their families can look very similar. So when you do identify them, type it in as the bird on the left or the bird on the right. And whether you think they're male or whether you think they're females. I see some of you uh, are starting to narrow down the one on the left. The one on the right's a little more tricky. <clears throat> I 
Yeah, some great, great answers coming in. Uh, we've narrowed down to the, the bird on the left. Uh, it is a female red-winged blackbird, um, but the one on the right can be a little tricky, um, especially the females in this family. Uh, I'm, I'll show you uh, the male, the male counterparts of these, and that might might help you narrow it down as well. So there is the classic uh, red-winged blackbird. Um, the females look so different than the males, uh, but if we look at them side by side, uh, you can actually tell that the beaks are very similar. They start out pretty wide and they go down into a point. Um, so looking and comparing the beaks is really important. And then on the female, they, they have that really streaky breast, um, which will kind of, and they're also uh, bigger than sparrows. So it kind of, if you look at the size, they're a little bit bigger than the sparrow. And on the right, uh, I see that some of us have gotten it. Uh, that is the female's Bullux oriole. So on the bottom, we have the male. You can tell it's a lot more, a lot brighter. It has that black on the throat um, and then the white patch on its black wings. Uh, I'm sure a lot of us here in Colorado have been seeing the Bullocks Orioles. They are beautiful birds. Um, I know I've really enjoyed them coming back. All right, so remember, uh, we are getting harder and harder, uh, especially with some females here. So I'm going to go on to the next slide. Uh, again, if you know them, let us know, but don't shout it out right away. Uh, and we'll try to identify these trickier species. All right, there could be two species here. There could be four species. Uh, I'm not gonna give it away too much. So try your best. Uh, let us know if you think some are males and if you think some are females. Uh, the good thing I think about these webinars or about field guides or practicing birding uh, is when you have a picture of them, they're not gonna fly away. So you might be watching these webinars thinking, oh, that's easy, that's definitely uh, a female red-winged blackbird. But when we go out to our, our when we go out birding uh, and they're flying around, it can be a, a lot more challenging. Ooh, someone said they have the one on the bottom right at their feeder right now, that's awesome. <laughs> I see some people's answers coming in. Uh, definitely we've narrowed it down to the two families, the tanagers and the gross beaks. Hmm, that's awesome. I actually have not seen, uh, so the bird on the right, uh, that is the black headed gross beak. Um, you can see it's got that black head. Uh, and then the gross beaks have those really conical beaks. Uh, why do you think they have those really bold beaks? Why do you think they need uh, that adaptation? Yep, busting open the shells of nuts. Those are very strong beaks. Um, awesome, yeah, so the top is the female, uh, black-headed gross beak. I know one time I only saw a female and it, it kind of stumped me for a little bit. Uh, it was my first of the season black-headed gross beak, and it was the female. Um, so that made it a little bit more challenging. Uh, the bird on the left, that is the Western tanager. Uh, the males, they're so beautiful. Um, when I think of the Western tanager, I get a picture in my mind of just a Western tanager on top of a spruce tree uh, singing its song. I feel like that's usually where I see them. Um, and then the bottom is the female Western tanager. Uh, and if we look at that, just looking at it and not having the size comparison of anything else, uh, that can really, it can be really, really tricky. Um, the female is pretty dull and kind of, you have to really look at those, um, those field marks. Like there's, it has some wing bars, uh, the color, the shape of the beak, the little swallow in its tail. All right, looks like we definitely have some more experienced birders with us in the chat. Uh, thank you so much for participating and thank you so much for uh, guessing. Again, it's okay to be wrong. Um, birding is a lifelong hobby that the more you do, the better you get. Um, so for that case, I made a bonus round um, to hopefully make it maybe a little bit harder or maybe these are birds that a lot of you have seen. So we're gonna do one more bonus round for our learning celebration. And I've numbered them. 
Uh, so feel free to identify them one at a time. Uh, if you don't know all four, that's okay. Um, but type in which number you might know. And again, uh, we are recording this webinar. So if you wanna go back at some point um, or when, we, when I send out the slides, uh, you can look a lot more in detail about the birds that I've posted. All right, some answers are starting to come in. Yeah, number two, that is the lazuli bunting, uh, or as some people like to call it, the lazuli bunting. Uh, I do not know which one is, is more correct. I feel like I hear equal of lazuli and lazuli, uh, but I learned lazuli bunting. Yeah, number four is, it's a type of Phoebe. It has that kind of characteristic uh, beak shape and the wings and the tail. See, a lot of us might be stumped a little bit on number one. Uh, it's, a, it's a harder one for sure. Uh, but again, look at, a, look at the field marks that you notice, the beak shape. Uh, look at any little wing bars they might have or uh, the overall shape of the bird. We don't really see the size, unfortunately, um, but we can look at kind of the shape of it. Uh, number two, that is the lazuli bunting. Uh, I like to call that the cover bird uh, because Sibley used the lazuli bunting as his cover bird for his uh, west edition. It's a beautiful bird. Some people are thinking that number one might be a type of Oriole. And I'll let you know it is a type of Oriole. Um, so now you can, hopefully you have your field guide out and you can try to narrow it down to, to know what type of Oriole. Yeah, and uh, number three is the Golden Crown Kinglet. Uh, these are so beautiful. I love seeing them up in the mountains, in the forest, uh, or even, Hearing the, the ruby crown and the golden crown, uh, the difference in their songs. Um, we did not go into identifying uh, by ear in this. I, I personally think that uh, song and call identification is a little more advanced. Um, so maybe we'll get into the bird song and identifying birds by call in a future webinar. Because uh, it is interesting and it is very hard. All right, I see some answers coming in for number one. Awesome. That is the female orchard oriole. Um, it's hard in Colorado because they, they do come a little bit into, into here and the, the female orchard oriole can look a lot like the female bullocks oriole. Uh, but again, really paying attention to those minute details that you see, um, the colors, uh, the difference in pattern of the feathers as well. So thank you so much. Uh, I love these learning celebrations. Uh, they're really fun to make. Um, it's really hard for me to pick birds because I want to pick a lot of them. Uh, so just a review, uh, number one, that is a female orchard oriole. Uh, those are more seen in uh, the central and eastern sides of the United States. Uh, number two, we have the lazuli bunting. Uh, the first lazuli bunting I saw was actually in the eastern Sierras and it blew my mind. Uh, they are such beautiful birds. Uh, number three, that is the golden crowned kinglet. Um, it's really cool to be able to see that crown up close. Uh, it's kind of like a yellow, flamey, orange uh, crown. Uh, the golden crown kinglets are another beautiful bird. And number four, that is the Says Phoebe. Uh, so that's the Phoebe that we see a lot um, out kind of in the grasslands and the prairie. Uh, they do the same tail flicking as a lot of fly catchers. Um, and that was probably the first uh, season migratory bird I saw this year was a a says Phoebe flying around. Oh yeah, great question. Uh, so if any of us have been able to look at or really observe Phoebe's flying around, uh, you might hear like a little snap. Um, and if you actually watch them, usually you hear that snap and then they kind of freeze in that moment and go back to the perch that they were at. Uh, and that's because they're, ca they're catching their insects, um, the fly catchers. Great question. All right. Thank you for the learning celebrations. We're gonna move on to the 
the latter part of our webinar here today. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about eBird. Uh, we talked about it in the beginning of this webinar and how it can be used as a tool for birders to find uh, birding hotspots and find new, new locations to bird. Uh, and there's a lot of different functions of eBird. Um, so I wanted to talk briefly about the community science part uh, of eBird because that's kind of how eBird started was to really get people out there submitting their observations um, of birds. So becoming a community scientist, eBird. Uh, if you talk to any birder, you know that eBird is a really cool, fun way for us to submit um, and keep a checklist of our birds. So quickly, I wanna talk about the definition of a community scientist, um, or it's also referred to as a citizen scientist. Uh, they are a member of the general public who collects and analyzes data relating to the natural world, typically as part of a collaborative project uh, with professional scientists. So I like to think of all of us as scientists. Um, if you're asking questions and you're looking for answers, uh, in my book, that makes you a scientist. Uh, it might not be your career, um, but everyday people can be scientists as well, um, just as long as we're out there and we're asking questions and learning. Uh, so as birders, our observations are greatly appreciated by the scientific community. Uh, there's a lot of birders out there in the world, um, and the more checklists we can submit, um, the more data that we provide those scientists. Uh, if you listen to Arvin's talk uh, at the DMNS Museum uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, he talked a lot about the three billion bird study and how we've lost three billion birds uh, since 1970. Uh, and eBird was actually a database that they, they relied heavily on uh, to gather that data. So eBird, uh, back in the day, before we had smartphones or before we had um, the any like birding apps, I used to log my checklist on the internet. Uh, so I would go out birding, I would write all of my findings on, in my notebook, and then I'd go home and plug them into my computer, and that was how I did my checklists. Nowadays, Cornell has created an, an amazing app uh, for this, and it's made using uh, eBird a lot easier and a lot more accessible. So what you can do is you can download the eBird app. It is a free app on your phone, um, and that's the first place to start. And then... Uh, either once you go birding or you want to just test it out in your backyard, what you're going to do uh, is you're going to be creating a species list or a checklist. Uh, so you'll start a new checklist. You see that button uh, with the wren on it. And that's going to pull up, if you have your location up, it's going to pull up the most likely birds that you're going to have uh, based on your GPS coordinates. Um, and then you're going to go birding. You're going to identify birds. Uh, you're going to have a great time. And with eBird, you can see on this checklist, uh, that was actually a checklist I did uh, the other day, um, is you're gonna type in the number of individuals that you see. That part is really important with eBird uh, because they do give you an option to put an X uh, or a number. As uh, scientists, we really wanna avoid using an X, uh, even if there's a large number of birds, uh, which we'll get to in a future webinar, I'm sure, is counting large numbers of birds. Uh, but for the sake of time, I just want to mention that if you put an X uh, next to a species, that's going to tell scientists not a lot because um, an X could mean that there is one or it can mean that there is 100,000. So really trying to estimate how many you see, um, even if it is just an estimate, that's going to, that's going to provide uh, a lot more data. So you can go out birding, uh, find as many birds and count as many birds as possible. Uh, when you're done, you finish your checklist and it's going to ask you a couple more questions. Uh, it's going to tell you how many birds you've seen and if it's correct. Uh, it's going to tell you if you're traveling by foot, or it's going to ask you if you're traveling by foot or by, by car, or if it, even if it was just incidental. Then one thing I really like is the number of observers. Uh, so a lot of us go birding in groups. That uh, is a great group activity. Um, what I like to do, especially when we're birding with our campers, uh, is I like to designate one person to be our e-birder. Uh, and that way they can focus on creating the list of the birds that you see. Um, it can be kind of hard doing it by yourself uh, in the moment. Um, and then you can actually share your checklist. Uh, so if, if I went out birding with a group of birders um, I, and they all had eBird accounts, I could just share the checklist with them um, and it'll go right into their data, uh, which is an awesome way to, to share your checklists. So 
that's as deeply as I'm going to dive into eBird. Um, I think the best way to learn is by doing. So if you have the chance uh, today or in the future, I challenge you to download the eBird app. Um, go in your backyard or go on your afternoon walk and try to enter uh, some bird species that you identify. Um, or even if you have a feeder outside uh, that has a lot of bird activity, uh, make a checklist um, and submit it because it's really good data. And personally, I think eBird is kind of like a game. Uh, it reminds me of you know, a challenging game where you know that there's more species out there and that you want to enter them into your, your checklist. Uh, so it makes me, I know, bird a little bit longer uh, because I want to get a really good checklist. eBird is also a great way uh, to keep your life list. Um, I'm still old school. My life list uh, is on a piece of paper that I write, uh, but eBird will actually uh, create that life list for you, for you and they'll let you know how many species uh, you've observed and entered into eBird. So lastly, I just want to remind everyone that the birding, it's a skill. Uh, the only way to get better at it is by practicing um, and spending that time in nature and spending the time observing birds. Uh, the more that you do it, the better you're going to get. Uh, I also think the better that you get at birding, uh, the harder that you'll actually find birding to be. Um, one, because you're more aware of the birds that you see around you. Uh, therefore, you're probably going to see more uh, just because you're looking. Uh, and two, because there are so many birds um, out there in the world. And once you start diving into females of species, um, and then in the fall when you're identifying young birds versus older birds um, and molting, um, all of these variations make it really hard um, and challenging as a birder. But birding also really sparks our curiosity. Uh, once you get into birding, uh, you'll be forever curious about the natural world and bird behavior. Um, I know I never stop birding. I could be outside gardening or even driving my car, uh, and I will definitely be trying to identify species in a very safe way. Um, also use the Merlin Bird ID app as you're learning. Uh, read your field guide, uh, really nerd out, because you're gonna learn a lot. Um, and also once you, you are able to do so, uh, try to join a birding group or try to find a mentor out there. Um, you learn a lot when you're with each other in collaborative learning. Um, and I know I learn a lot more either, even when I'm leading bird walks uh, or in a group of people because you're all providing that knowledge. So that is uh, towards the end of our webinar here. Uh, please keep in touch. Um, I do wanna say that as many of you might know, um, our education programs have been uh, brought to a halt this spring uh, and we've been doing more virtual programming like this, which have been fun. Uh, but unfortunately with the COVID-19, we have lost, uh, suffered a 30% loss in program revenue this spring. Um, and that revenue helps with my salary and the salary of all of our educators. Um, so if you are in a position to help us keep education programs like this going, uh, especially during these uncertain times, um, again, if you, if you have the means, please support us. Um, you can find our donation link uh, at birdconservancy.org um, or even just paying the extra dollars uh, for our programs. It really helps us out um, and we are so thankful for your help uh, because we love doing these. We love sharing our knowledge. So next week, uh, we're going to keep our birding series going. Uh, next Thursday, please join Stacy. Uh, she's going to be talking about a really, really cool group of birds. Uh, she's going to be talking more about corvids. Uh, so if you know corvids, you know that they're very interesting. Um, I don't want to spoil anything, uh, but Stacy will be here next week uh, with you all teaching about corvids. Um, I also want to plug that we are currently doing virtual bird banding programs uh, with Denver Audubon. Um, so on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, uh, myself and Sarah and Meredith, we get to go out to the Denver Audubon Center at Chatfield, and we are running a digital program. Uh, so I will include a registration link in my follow-up email if that is something that you're interested in. Uh, so again, that is the end of our webinar. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you all are happy and healthy. Uh, thanks for sticking around and learning about birds. Uh, we will stick around and answer any questions that I might have missed. Um, so feel free to type in any questions that you have. And um, Sarah, you can unmute yourself too if you have seen any questions that you didn't get to. All right. Um, I didn't see any questions. There's one just last 
that just came in about if we were going to have any webinars about making our backyards more bird friendly. And the good news is we have already done it and you can view it on our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and search um, for Bird Conservancy, I believe it's called Birdie Backyard. So that'll give you some good recommendations. Yeah. Um, and then I'm also, I will be sending out again the recording of this webinar uh, of our YouTube channel. And I've also uh, been including uh, our slides and I've also been including um, the PDF of our slides and then relevant links that we've talked about. Uh, so everyone will get that PDF of these slides. Uh, let's see, I have two more questions. One is any binocular recommendations? And another one is where would be a good place to see tanagers and gross beaks? Cool. Uh, so I feel like the binocular uh, recommendations are, we get those every time. Um, it's a great, great question. Uh, there's a lot of different types out there. Um, if I were to recommend any personally, uh, I would recommend the Vortex brand. Um, they have a great uh, warranty. They have a lifetime, no questions warranty. Um, and the 8x42 magnification is great. Uh, if you want a little tighter feel of view, uh, I use the 10x42. Um, so Vortex are great. Uh, what else is out there? Um, there's Pentax. There's Nikon, uh, they all make great ones. Uh, I'd say if you have the opportunity, now that stores are opening up, uh, go and try some out before you buy them. Yeah, that is a really personal thing. It's really good to get your eyes on different binoculars um, to, to pick the best ones. Um, let's see, we had a question about our banding. Ooh, oh yeah, and before we get to that, I there was a question about tanagers and gross beaks. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, I forget, I don't know where the person is, is from, but I know we, we get a lot of tanagers and gross beaks kind of in our foothills. Uh, so if you're in Denver, if you go up near Golden or Evergreen um, or Boulder, uh, you'll see a lot more in the wild. Uh, I also read people in the chat window that we're attracting them to their yards. Um, so they do like bird seed. Um, so keep an eye out for the, the tanagers and gross beaks because they're definitely around right now during migration. Uh, and then the banding programs. Uh, so me and Sarah, uh, we are the educators. So we will be there just educating um, about what Meredith, who is our bander, what she is doing. Uh, we have some pretty strict protocols that we're following, um, which is great because we can at least get these, we can at least get out and ban some birds. Um, so Meredith is the only one that will be handling the birds. Uh, and then Sarah and myself get to teach you all about what she's doing and all the cool things that bird banding has. Okay, I think the last question I see for now at least is, do birds make different sounds when they're flying versus when they're just sitting? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, so when birds are flying, uh, they're most likely to make calls. Um, they're not so much singing a song. Uh, so when they're in flight, you'll hear more of like chips or peeps uh, or flittering noises um, as they're in flight. But if they're perched, that's when you're gonna see them belting out uh, their beautiful songs. Uh, so yeah, when they're perched, you're most likely to hear a song. Uh, and then when they're in flight, you'll hear what they're, it's called flight calls. All right. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I know I've had a blast uh, putting these webinars together and teaching you all about birds. Um, if you have the chance today, get out. Try to make an eBird checklist. Um, look more at those eBird hotspots because they're really interesting and they're really fun to, to nerd out on. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, again, come here next week. We'll be here for another webinar. So thank you all and I hope you all have a great day.